thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Colligan. I'm a professor of philosophy here at the University of Sydney and also have an appointment in the Munich Centre for Mathematical Philosophy. Um, just a little bit about me. I tend to work on the mathematical end of philosophy. You might, uh, as mathematicians, you might not know what that is. Philosophy and mathematics, to some people, seem like they're a long way apart. But in fact, they're not. I started out in mathematics and defected to, to philosophy at some stage. And most of my work is on the mathematical issues that arise in philosophy and using mathematical methods to solve or and shed light on at least some philosophical problems. And this is an example of some of the things I'm interested in in this, in this particular talk. I'm going to look at the role of statistics in the courtroom. Um, I sent the abstract out, so it's presumably you've seen that, I won't bother reading through that. So first let me say a word about the, 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 the target here, if you like. Um, the phrase has come into vogue or legal probability. And this is the view that you can sort out a lot of what's going on in the courtroom via looking at probability theory. Okay, so probability and the law have a very checkered history. Many have been critical of use of probability theory in the courtroom. Uh, Lawrence Tribe in a very famous article, Trial by Mathematics, was very critical of the use of statistics in the courtroom. Uh, Susan Parker, a very prominent current uh, legal theorist, uh, criticised this view and she uses the term legal probabilism as a pejorative term, it's supposed to be sort of a bad thing to be using probability. Uh, I'm just going to use it neutrally. Uh, I count myself as a legal probabilist, so I embrace the, the title. Um, try and uh, get rid of the, the, the majority tone to it. Though. So there are many genuine concerns about statistical evidence in the courtroom. Um, some worried about likelihood ratios, some use, worried about the use of Bayes' theorem in the courtroom. Here I'll focus on what's often called naked statistical evidence. Um, roughly this is statistical evidence without any other so-called specific evidence about the individual in question. Uh, the examples will help get clear about what, what we're talking about here. But this is one of the, one of the uh, contested uses of statistics in the court. So before I get to the naked statistical evidence, I just a couple of questions about the, uh, sorry, a couple of comments rather, about the methodology. So we could look for cases where statistical evidence alone was used to convict. After all, what we're doing here is we're trying to get a grip on whether statistical evidence, this naked, so-called naked statistical evidence, is legitimate in the courtroom. So what we could do is we could look for some real cases where a conviction perhaps went through because of naked statistical evidence and then we could argue that that was the wrong result, right? Um, or it runs, the conviction runs counter to reasonable intuitions. The problem is that real cases are typically really messy and it's hard to isolate the role of the nakedness of the statistical evidence and the role that that's playing in delivering the intuitions in question. Um, so for example, there are lots of cases where statistics have been misused in the courtroom. Right? Really poor usage of statistics. The, 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 the law is littered with such examples. But that's not a refutation of statistics, right? That's a refutation of bad statistics. And we all know if you do statistics wrong, you can get bad results. That's not a reason to reject statistics, although you sometimes hear such things in, in, in the, uh, the public domain. That's just this guy. Right? What you want to do is get your statistics right. And so what we want here, or at least the, my opponents as it were, the people who want to criticise legal probabilism, what they need to do is find some clear cases where the statistics have been done correctly, good statistics, and uh, it's the naked statistical evidence that's doing the work and it gets the wrong result. Right? Getting the wrong result is easy, right? Lots of cases where the statistics have been done bad. For example, there was a very, very famous case in the UK where a um, poor woman had two children 
die subsequently of sudden infant death syndrome. And the probability of that was calculated. The probability of one sudden infant death syndrome was considered very unlikely. The probability of the next one was considered the same unlikely. They multiplied them together, which anyone who knows anything about statistics implies that those events are independent. It's well known that they're not independent. Whatever it is that, that gives rise to sudden infant death syndrome, it could be a genetic component, it could be environmental, but they certainly know that they're not independent. So again, that was just bad statistics. Sadly, she was convicted of the jail time. It was eventually overturned, but she did quite a bit of time in jail um, because of this bad statistical evidence, right? So we're not talking about such cases. We're talking about cases where the stats are done correctly, and yet they still seem to get the wrong result. That's what, what, that's what the, uh, my opponents are uh, looking for. So it's turning away from the real cases then because they're so messy and there's so much else going on. Legal theorists and philosophers of law have turned to thought experiments, or so-called toy models, to isolate the nakedness of the statistics in question. And this is kind of familiar, familiar methodology in stats as well, right? You open any stats textbook, the first couple of examples are, you know, perfectly rolled dice under ideal conditions, a perfectly tossed coin, you know, which is genuinely uh, stochastic, right? Um, these are examples. There are no such things. Dice have slight weights, so do the coins, uh, you know. But they're your typical examples. Then you extrapolate from that to general uses of probability theory, right? And you learn from that. It's good to learn from these ideal situations, these toy cases. So, same sort of methodology here, nothing unusual. Okay, so the toy model methodology, the idea is to present an imagined case where the legal probabilist should be satisfied with conviction or with awarding damages if it's a, if it's a, uh, a, a civil case. Because the naked statistical evidence meets the relevant standard by construction, to construct the example such that you meet whatever the standard is that you need. And yet there'll be strong intuitions that we should not convict or award damages. The intuition sometimes put, something's missing. You've got the probability high enough, but still you wouldn't want to convict. Right? That's the idea. What could this something be? This something else? Well, it can't be probability, because, so the argument goes at least, um, we constructed the example to give you the probability that's high enough. So for example, if you're look, talking about a uh, case, a criminal case, where this relevant standard is beyond reasonable doubt, right? And let's suppose that you think by and beyond reasonable doubt is probability 0.95, right? Um, that's not a bad uh, 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 clarification of what beyond reasonable doubt means in probability terms. So you say 0.95. So you construct your example where the probability is higher than 0.95 and yet you still want to say, no, I don't want to do that. Right? That's what we're aiming for here. Um, what could this something else be? Well, it can't be probability because you constructed the example such that the probability is correct, it is, is sufficiently high. So probabilism and naked statistical evidence have been, at best, uh, have, have a limited role to play in the court. That's the, that's the sort of conclusion of these people. So we've, we've got these examples. They show that even the legal probabilist wants to balk at conviction in these cases. So by their own admission, probability has either no role in the courtroom or only a limited role, but you can't just set things up in terms of probability. And just to get a clearer idea of what this legal probability amounts to is you might say, for instance, what does beyond reasonable doubt mean? You say probability 0.95. What does preponderance of evidence mean? More than 0.5. Well, actually, that's a pretty easy one. That's surely what preponderance of evidence means, but but still you find people say, I don't want to spell it out in probabilistic terms. I want to keep it intuitive um, or the like. I, it's not quite clear what the alternative is that's part of the trouble here, I think. But they certainly resist the spelling out of these legal standards in terms of probability. As I said, just to show my cards right from the get-go, I'm not such a person. I think spell this out in terms of probability. Probability done properly. And now we're going to look at these thought experiments and uh, just
just feel, you know, for you, first, if you're first time you've seen these, feel the force of the experiment. Sort of feel why it's supposed to draw you to be against the probability judgments here. Okay, so first toy model, it's usually called blue bus. Mrs. Brown is run down by a bus. 60% of the buses that travel along the street in question are owned by the blue bus company and 40% of the, by the red bus company. The only witness is colorblind. Given the lack of further information, one could argue that there is a 0.6 probability that Mrs. Brown was run down by a blue bus. Yet the overwhelming intuition is that 60% statistic here is not sufficient for Mrs. Brown to prove a case in a civil trial. Okay, a civil trial here is not a criminal case. A civil trial she looks to sue the company that ran her down. And in a civil trial, you just need to show that it's more likely than not preponderance of evidence. Okay, so if you interpret that probabilistically, you need to prove that it's more than 0.5 probable that there was a, a um, which one was it? The uh, blue bus rather than the red bus. And that's seen by construction of the example, right? 60% of the buses are blue buses, 40% are red, so it's more likely, 60 point probability 0.6, that it was a blue bus. So the construction of the example, you can see how this works, right? Construction of the example is designed to give you precisely the result that you want, and yet, at least, you know, there's a, there's a pull to say, no, you want something more than that, surely, than just the pure statistical evidence here. We'll get to a criticism of this example shortly, but just to, for a moment, just sort of feel the force of that example. It's supposed to, even those statistically minded amongst us, are supposed to sort of feel some crimes about uh, awarding damages against the blue bus company just because they have the great market share. Second toy model is usually called prisoners. 100 prisoners are exercising in the prison yard. 99 of them suddenly join in a planned attack on a prison guard. The 100th prisoner plays no part. There is no evidence available to show who joined in and who did not. Is the 0.99 probability that a randomly chosen prisoner is guilty, is that enough to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he or she is guilty? The intuition, the alleged intuition perhaps I should say, the alleged intuition here is that it is not. This does not seem to be explained by the fact that 0.99 is not high enough probability to satisfy beyond reasonable doubt, um, because surely that is whatever beyond reasonable doubt is supposed to mean in probabilistic terms. I suggested 0.95 before, but perhaps you want to be even more conservative, 0.99, this satisfies whatever you mean by beyond reasonable doubt, 0.99 is high enough. Um, moreover, if you don't think that that's, you think that's the problem, 0.99 is not high enough for beyond reasonable doubt, just change the example, make it a thousand prisoners and one who opts out, right? You can construct, construct an example, sort of, tell me what you mean by uh, beyond reasonable doubt, and then I'll construct an example that meets that standard, and yet allegedly has this uh, feature that you're inclined to think that you would want more. Now, just, just a comment before we go on, you might think beyond reasonable doubt means absolute certainty, but that just can't be right. There's no absolute certainty about anything, even in mathematics, right? Mathematics, philosophers often use mathematics as the one place where you get absolute certainty. How many people have made a mistake in a proof? How many proofs have been corrected, published proofs have been corrected after the fact, right? Mistakes appear in mathematics as well. So maybe a perfectly valid proof is absolutely certain, but how are you certain that it's a perfectly valid proof? It's always uncertainty, uncertainty about anything. I don't think it's raining at the moment. I could be wrong. There's a very, very small chance I could be wrong about that. Right? So there are no certainties in the world. But if there are very, very few, and certainly in the courtroom, if you said we can only convict if we are absolutely certain, probability one that the person is guilty, you're going to have no convictions. Right? So what you're doing in probability, in the courtroom, um, forget about probability for the moment, what you're doing in the courtroom 
is doing a cost benefit analysis, right? Trying to get most of the guilty people, but not all. You, you, you make the burden of proof such that it's got to be a very, very compelling case to convict someone. And you often see this, this um, mis you know, the pronouncement of not guilty really is a failure to convict. It's not proof that they're not guilty. Like you see this mistake over and over again. People on the steps of the courthouse saying, the court has vindicated my innocence. No, the court did no such thing. The court had not enough evidence to convict you. Now, you may be innocent, but it might be that you're guilty, and they thought that you were guilty, but just didn't feel that there was sufficient evidence to pronounce guilty, right? So what you're trying to do in the courtroom is trying to sentence as many guilty people as you can without making the horrible mistake of sending some of innocent people to prison, right? You've got this, you know, think, think of it in terms of hypothesis testing, type one and type two error, right? So type one error here is the false positive, right? Where you send a innocent person to jail. That's a really bad, really bad mistake. The other type of error is setting free a guilty person. In, and in a, you know, a, a liberal society, a small liberal society, we would be inclined to err one way rather than the other. We'd rather set a few guilty people free than to convict uh, a large portion of innocent people. So just a word about the certainty here, you might think, okay, just hold out the certainty here. That's what, why the 0.99 is not good enough. You want absolute certainty on probability one. No, you're never going to have that. Okay, so a word of caution now about thought experiments in general. When constructing thought experiments, we need to make sure that the situation is coherent and well understood. It does not invite the reader to bring in additional baggage that might get in the way. And it needs to isolate the hypothesis in question, very much like real experiments. So there's a good reason to doubt that our earlier toy model satisfied these conditions. Um, we also need to distinguish the epistemic question of probability of guilt, liability, from the decision theoretic question of punishment and damages. Uh, I could say a little bit about that in question time if you like. Um, but it's worth remembering that what you're doing, say if you're a jury member, you're making a decision to pronounce guilty rather than believing to be guilty. Okay, what's the distinction there? Um, it's about whether you're prepared to act upon the belief in question. And it's well known, I, I won't go into details. In decision theory, in order to make, perform some action, you require both beliefs and um, utilities. So for instance, if I've got a biased coin, I can prove to you that it's a biased coin. It comes up here to 0.8, probability of heads is 0.8, probability of tails is 0.2. I can get you to bet on tails, right? Even though you don't believe it will come up tails, you believe it will come up heads, but I can get you to bet on tails just by making the money right. Okay? A million dollars if it comes up tails, two dollars if it comes up heads, what bet do you want? Um, you'll take tails. That's what, that's what lottery's all about, right? Um, something that you think is really improbable, but you're inclined to act, as a, act upon it because the price is right. So what you might think in the, in the courtroom, why are there such high standards of evidence for criminal conviction beyond reasonable doubt, is in part best explained by uh, decision theory. Right? The disutility of getting it wrong sending an innocent person to jail is so bad that you want to make sure that you're really certain. But it, I, I would imagine it's an everyday occurrence on, in, in um, the juries where you think, I think this person's guilty, but I don't think we've got sufficient evidence to pronounce guilty. Right? I'm sure that happens routinely. It may not articulate it uh, in, a, in such terms, but I'm sure that's, that's a common occurrence. Okay, so let's back to the blue bus. Let's just summarize what we're being asked to do here. We've been asked to imagine something very unreasonable when you think about it. There's no further information. When reading this example, one naturally fills in the impoverished scenario with bits of realistic detail. But all you're allowed to know is that 60% of the buses on this street 
are blue buses, 40% are red buses. No further information. But we know that buses don't run randomly down the streets. There are things called timetables, right? So you naturally think, without even sort of thinking about it, you're naturally sort of bringing this into the party, into the, the scenario. You're thinking about these buses running to some sort of timetable, right? Because that's what buses do. But what you're really being asked to imagine here is completely stochastic bus timetables by two bus companies just randomly sending buses down the street, 60% of which are blue, 40% are red. It's crazy, right? So what you do is, when you're given that information, you try and make sense of it in a way that makes sense with it being a bus. It's a bus. Bus is like a bus timetable. So you might ask about accident rates of the two companies. Maybe the red buses are involved in many more accidents. Surely that's pertinent. Um, and such information is usually freely available and accessible. Moreover, ignoring such freely available information may completely undermine the probability assessment of the pilot toy model. Okay, so you say the probability of the accident being a blue bus is 0.6, but what if the bus timetable said that the accident occurred at night and the blue bus company doesn't run at night, it only runs during the day? That doesn't just change it from 0.6 to a little bit lower. That completely invalidates the model. So in real cases, we can have doubts about the narrative, for instance. When someone says to you, 60% of the buses are blue, is that exactly 60%? You're telling me that there are exactly 100 buses, say, and exactly 60 of them blue? You know, is Sarah, is that a, rough estimate, or perhaps the person telling you the story works for the red bus company. Yeah. There's all reasons to doubt the narrative. Now, of course, in the thought experiment, you don't get to do that. You're supposed to just take it on faith. But all these natural intuitions about worrying about the validity, um, veracity of te uh, testimony, worrying about the exact figures, whenever someone says 60%, my ears immediately go up. I think, exactly 60%. And what a coincidence that would be if it's exactly 60%, right? Surely they're rounded up or rounded down. Have they rounded up or rounded down correctly? Do they know enough about you know, significant figures and the like to do the rounding up properly, right? Um, all of this brings to mind. So, while I agree that there is this sort of feeling that there should be something more in this case, what do I think the something more is, is that in normal cases, real cases like this, you could freely access further information like the bus timetable. Maybe you could find out exactly what bus it was at that time of the day. Suppose you had further information that buses really run to the timetables exactly, right? Not like Sydney buses, but <laughs> buses where things are really organised and you can know exactly what bus it I mean, why wouldn't you do that? Why would you persevere with this statistical model when you can do much better. Prison yard. I'm going to say the same sorts of things, right? Again, we have no further information about what went on in the prison yard. That's an important part in isolating the naked statistical evidence here, right? It's important for the thought experiment to work that there is no further information. No further information? No video surveillance? No testimony? Can you ask, can you talk to the prisoners, say, were you involved in this, were you not? Can you look at the people, were those that were, you know, had scuffs and bruises that were involved in? Surely there's, you know, there's further information that's easily accessible here. But here there's another problem as well. It matters whether you prosecute a randomly selected prisoner or the 100. Um, in the original example, it says, is this 0.99 probability of a randomly chosen prisoner, right? So you might think that it's enough, the probability is high enough, but there's some issue to do with justice here. Pulling just one of them out and prosecuting that one is just unfair, and that's why you think, okay, it's not a good idea. Um, Consider a parking inspector who finds 10 cars illegally parked. And I suppose there's no doubt 
absolutely certain that these cars are illegally parked, and then the parking the inspector issues a ticket for just one, you say that's not right. You either prosecute, you either give tickets to all of them or none of them, but picking out one is unfair. So part of the problem in this case, I think, is there's a serious issue to do with justice. Picking out one prisoner is just bad form. And I, I, and I leave it to you to think about your own intuitions here. But um, my own intuition here is if you change the wording of the problem so that it says prosecute all 100 prisoners, I have no problems about that. I don't have any, I mean, I know that you kind of then, for certain, prosecuting one innocent person, but one in a hundred is actually not too bad if you look at legal cases, right? That's not too bad. It's bad, you know, you don't want to be doing that, but that's, that's not too bad. Um, so my intuition is indeed that prosecuting one, I would not want to do that, but prosecuting all 100, I have no qualms with that. At least the strong intuition you're supposed to have that there's something wrong with naked statistical evidence, I think evaporates if you really do isolate the naked statistical evidence here and prosecute all 100. Okay, so this is not an attack on thought experiments in general. Just as with real experiments, they need to be carefully designed. Um, in particular, thought experiments need to be designed so that the hypothesis in question is isolated. Um, actual science, you know, day one, first week, right? In the experimental stuff, you know, hypothesis testing. How do you go about isolating hypotheses? It turns out it's extraordinarily difficult, much more difficult than you're led to believe in your first year practice. Uh, and indeed, some have argued that you can never completely isolate a single hypothesis. But you want to isolate it from other contentious hypotheses, hypotheses at least. And what's going on here is, I think these thought experiments fail to do that. The thought experiments that take centre stage in the native statistical evidence debate, they don't do this. But now, that's not to say that there aren't other thought experiments that they could be presented. But what's interesting is, so much of the debate about statistics in the courtroom revolves around these two, and then there's a couple of others that have similar flaws, and I won't go into the details of those, um, but they're very similar to these examples. So, if you think that there's something wrong with uh, naked statistical evidence and you want to do that via thought experiments, I say come up with some better thought experiments because these ones just don't cut it. Another approach would be to go to the real cases, messy though they may be, there may be some cleaner cases there where the statistical evidence is doing a lot of the work. And I think cold hit DNA matches are very much like. So DNA evidence provides extremely high probability, well beyond reasonable doubt. Um, is there a problem with standalone DNA evidence? Is there something missing? So what I mean by a cold hit DNA case is where you've got the DNA from a crime scene and you just run it through a database and you find a match and then you say that person's guilty, convict them. No further question, did they know the victim? Did they have reason to kill the victim? Did, you know, whatever, whatever the story is. No, no effect further has involved just this cold hit um, DNA field. So under ideal conditions, the chance of false positive, so I'm told um, by people who know more about this than me, is currently around about 10 to the minus 11. That's a really, really small chance of false positive. And any other evidence, eyewitness testimony, much less reliable than this. Um, those of you who've done some psychology might know this. Um, it's, it's extraordinary that people think something about seeing with your own eyes, eyewitness testimony is somehow privileged and special. Psycholo psychology literature does not bear that out. <laughs> it's unbelievably un <laughs> unreliable. Um, all sorts of experiments to show how unreliable eyewitness testimony is. And I don't mean sort of dark conditions and slightly difficult condition. There have been cases, for instance, where someone will be talking to someone in the street, a stranger, but they've been engaging in conversation, and people will walk past through the conversation with a wardrobe or something just to block the view, and then they switch 
person. It's a completely different person, and then the, the person continues talking to them as if it was a person. Completely different person. The facial recognition is, is um, not nearly as good as we would like to think. So eyewitness testimony is, is, is actually quite poor. Most other forms of evidence that you're talking about, fingerprints, so on and so forth, nowhere near as good as the DNA matches. So if you've got a DNA match, it's very tempting to say the probability of a false positive here is 10 to the minus 11. And I'm not sure that there, about your own intuitions here, it's worth thinking about them for a moment, but uh, a lot of people have the intuition that that shouldn't be enough, for the same sorts of reasons as the thought experiment. Somehow just pulling someone out of the database who's got the DNA match with the, uh, the, the, the crime scene DNA is not enough. Even though chances of a false positive here are 10 to the minus 11. Um, why would you think that that's not enough? Well, let me spell this out a little. The proviso is that under ideal conditions, the probability is 10 to the minus 11. But that's important. What is the probability of sample contamination in the lab, for example? We need to know that. That it does, in fact, happen from time to time. Sample contamination at the crime scene. Um, errors in the lab of other kinds. Now, I'm not saying that this stuff is widespread, but it does happen. And when you, what's interesting about these cases is when you find out, for instance, that the crime scene was contaminated and you're no longer confident that the DNA you have is the DNA of the perpetrator, then you don't say, okay, well, 10 to the minus 11, let's bump the probability of false positive up a little bit, but let's call it 10 to the minus 9. You don't do that. You say, no, the statistical model is invalidated. Right. So, for example, um, you're examining the crime scene, you find some DNA, you find a hair, and you have this hair, and it matches, and then you find that the match is with you. Right? You're the you know, chief investigator on, the, on the, the, uh, the homicide squad, say, and you think, oh, one of my hairs must have fell out and contaminated the crime scene. So you don't think that the probability of 10 to the minus 11 means anything at all think, okay, now it's a bad statistical model from the start because I, I assumed that the crime scene was not contaminated, and clearly it was. Now, of course, you've got to be careful here because it could be that there's a crooked, crooked cop who you know, is involved in the crime and their DNA is evidence, but very often you're inclined to just dismiss a lot of the DNA in the crime scene. So you need a guarantee that the DNA in question is DNA from the perpetrator. And that's nowhere near 10. So if you do think that something extra is involved here, it might be this some assurances that the statistical model you're using is in fact the correct one. Um, this is so kind of well known in the model uh, scientific modeling literature, known as meta uncertainty or model uncertainty. So you've got a model, your model delivers such and such a result, but there's uncertainty about whether you've got the model right. Think about it, you know, not just with probability, probability models, but think about you know, mathematical models. You're asked to solve an applied maths problem. You set up a kind of mathematical a bunch of equations or something to, to solve this problem. And there's uncertainty about whether those equations faithfully represent the system in question. You know, fluid flowing through a pipe, and you, 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 you invoke uh, relevant differential equations. But the relevant differential equations might assume that there's no turbulence. Is that a reasonable assumption? So you've got all of these uh, uncertainties about whether the model you're using is in fact the correct model. And the same thing here. So a statistical model, is that model the correct model? Is it the best model? Is it getting the right answers? That's uncertainty about the model itself. Think of that as meta uncertainty, higher level uncertainty. Okay, how do we deal with better uncertainty? Very, very difficult very difficult to know how to deal with this. Um, think of better uncertainty as uncertainty about the statistical model or such uncertainty is not resolved by making first order probability smaller or larger. Typically, we need another statistical model, model, for instance, the screw-ups in the lab. So you might have statistical data 
on how frequently screw-ups in the lab occur and then use that, or how often the crime scene is contaminated with the DNA of innocent victims, innocent parties. But now there's kind of the infinite regress loop in here. We've got a statistical model, we need another statistical model to validate that. And then you can say, but what about that second one? And so on. So there's this problem of infinite regress. Worse still, the meta uncertainty sometimes is very large and you can completely invalidate the statistical model, right? Like finding your own DNA in a crime scene. Um, if you just think, well, that's, the, that's not the DNA of the perpetrator, and that's the DNA of one of the investigators. So that statistical model is completely invalidated. Just like you know, a simple little type of can invalidate a computer program. Just one little mistake, and you're going to think, oh, well, that, the computer program's mostly right, no, <laughs> certain mistakes can just make the whole thing fail to run. Okay, finally, let me just wrap up a little bit about ethics and statistics. Given the seriousness of legal decisions and the ethical consequences of such decisions, we require suitably high levels of confidence in legal judgments. As I said earlier, spelled out in decision theoretic terms. I haven't really done that here, but that's what that's how it's to my way of thinking it should be done. And this includes high level of confidence in the statistical models used. So for example, the law usually requires demonstrations of means, motive, and opportunity in criminal cases. And you might think of these as sort of extra requirements, the little boxes you've got to tick. Did the person have the means to commit the crime? Did they have the motive to commit the crime? Did they have the opportunity to commit the crime? Tick, tick, tick. Okay, good, good to go. Um, I don't think of these as extra requirements taking priority over statistical evidence. Rather, I think of these as basic checks that is all, all is in order with a statistical model. Right? So you've got a cold hit DNA match with someone and they weren't born at the time of the crime, then that's a pretty clear indication that, 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 that they did not have the opportunity or, or the motive. Right? So that would mean that there's something wrong with the statistical model. Um, and indeed, these are routinely done in these cold hit cases. What you'd like to see is a cold hit from someone who is known to live in the area at the time, or was easily about, easily uh, accessible to the area, or knew the victim, that would be better still, right? So these don't change the probability from probability of false positive being 10 to the minus 11. That still stands, that's the statistics of the DNA match. This just gives you confidence that you've got the right uh, statistical model. So in my view, there's something missing, if there is something missing, is epistemic in nature, to do with probabilities, or rather meta-epistemic, if you prefer. It's, it's about our knowledge of the situation. Um, and we, what we would like is some assurances, not just that the probabilities are high enough for a conviction or for a, award damages in civil cases, but that we are confident in the statistical model we've used to deliver that probability. And that requires a little bit of extra work. And that's the something that's missing, I think, in both the toy cases and in some of the, the real cases. Are there any additional ethical considerations? Is there any other place where you think it's sort of just unethical to, to convict via statistics and statistics alone? Thanks very much. And there's a few, there's a few uh, further examples of some further reading for anyone who might want to follow this up.